people so this is not Nanaesi again and I'll say for the very first time if you are watching me you know my name is Nanaesi just like I said uh, welcome to Black Next Gen and um, I I'm really interested as to the main reason why I've had to come to see you today or have to come and um, introduce myself back to you again mainly Black Next Gen is running a project and what Black Next Gen seek to do is we bring people from different backgrounds, you know, mainly black and minority groups who have got stories to tell. The main reason why I'm really, really buzzing today is the people that I have got on my panel today. For the very first time, I've got two people that I will be interviewing. And these are two, I don't know whether to use the word young lads, but these are two men, you know, who have gone through, um, you know what, they've done a bit of naughty stuff, yeah? But the very interesting thing is they are now working with young people who are possibly now going through those dips and their main role is mentoring. Their main priority is to be able to help whatever the background is. To be able to understand that, yes, we understand you as a young person, but we are going to be there for you. So they don't do the nagging bits. They are in there. They work with schools. They work with families. They work, you know, maybe to deem them as vulnerable young people or vulnerable families. The most important thing is they believe in these young people that they work with. So just hold on a minute. I will bring on, you know, these two very important people. And uh, yeah, we will have to hear from these people who maybe their young people think they are the ever righteous. They never are. But just hold on a minute. You hear their stories and possibly believe your young people to actually make some of the changes that they actually made, you know, as young people growing up. And now they are actual grown men. Okay, so guys, just like I said, you know, I've got these two amazing men, you know, <laughs> before you today and, you know, I had to definitely grind them to be able to get a bit of their time because they are busy men, yeah? Yo, can I get you to be more or less introduce yourself? I think you've got amazing stories to tell. Can you please introduce yourselves so that people out there who watch Black Next Gen will know who we're talking to today? Definitely. Alright, so my name's Leon Simpson. Um, I work with young people, obviously from vulnerable backgrounds and obviously that are in vulnerable places um, to support them to do better, basically. That's great. Are we good to you? Yeah, my name's Akwesi Pedimo and I'm a, I'm a director for a company for, called Apps Improve uh, that helps supporting young, vulnerable people and families. Mm. Um, yeah. That's great. So if anybody is watching it and you want to gain a bit of background, how to improve basically work with, you know, vulnerable young people, vulnerable families. And I think it's really, really important that through this conversation, we will start to understand the reasons why um, Leon and Akwesi possibly chose their pathways. Yeah. Because possibly they may not have come from that affluent background. Am I right to say yeah, that? Definitely. Yeah. Or maybe you guys were born pop stars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It may not be the case. Okay, so who do we start with? Let's start with Akwesi. Akwesi, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, in terms of where you were born, you know, and, um, you know, yeah, a bit of your background. Right, okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah, all right, so my background, I was uh, born in London, um, just on the outskirts, Harrow, a place called Norfolk Park, um, raised on an estate called Norfolk, Radcliffe Way Estate. Okay. Um, Oof, right, where do we start? Now, Radcliffe Way back in the 80s, 90s as well, was, it was a racist area. Okay. Uh, we were the only blacks, if I can remember, on the estate. From, from recollection, I'd probably say to the age of six, and then a neighbour moved in from uh, India. He was, uh, used to live on the, the, one of the other levels above us and that was it the okay. school that i went to viking first school viking middle school again i was the only i was the only black person in that class and then a girl joined in later and then that person who joined um the, the estate also attending that school as well mm. um got sent to africa Ghana, okay. when i was younger you did yes i did why <laughs> because uh, my brother was involved in selling drugs at a young age okay. um, through the influence that, through his friends, 
and my brother was my role model. Okay, your brother was yeah, your role model. My role model, man. You okay. Know, I wanted to aspire to be just like him. Okay. Um, and so just like how role models are, you want to be just like that role model. He was selling drugs at the time. Um, and how old was he then? I think he was 16. Okay. 16. Okay. Uh, now, what I can remember is when I was around eight, right now, back in the 80s, the Navy used to call cannabis, cannabis. The Navy used to call it, you know, we, they mm. call it grass. Okay. And so as a kid, uh, I just kept hearing this word, this name, grass, 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 yeah. grass, grass, yeah. grass, gamma, grass. And so I thought, you know what? I want to know what this grass is all about. Mm. I want to smoke some of this grass. I want to okay. see what it gives you, how it makes you feel. And so yeah, I went out to the back garden, had some A4 paper, got some grass, rolled it up, didn't sprinkle it, just, you know, smothered it in this yeah. A4 paper, uh, and made the fattest, biggest joint grass. There ain't no cannabis in this <laughs> roll of A4 paper. So that is you being the age of eight, yeah. and more or less exploring what you thought was going on for yeah. you in terms of when people talk about grass. Yeah. Go on, Akwesi. And then, so I smoked it. Okay. It did nothing for me apart from making me cough. Yeah. Um, and at that time when I was smoking it, my mum was walking past and so I had to quickly run it underneath the cold water. Uh, mum came through the door, started giving me some licks, started slapping me up, thinking that I was setting fire to the house because okay. all she smelled was smoke. Okay. She didn't know I was smoking grass. <laughs> you are smoking grass? Hey, <laughs> I think I would have got destroyed. I think I would have got thrown over Sadana. Okay, um, okay. But yeah, and so what happened was my behaviour was deteriorating, it was getting worse, and so eventually I got sent over to Ghana. At the age of eight? At the age of eight, yeah. Did you go to like a particular family member you knew? No. So who did you go to then? Strangers. Wow. So that was like my care system. That was like the equivalent of a care system over here in this country. Mm. It was literally sent on a plane um, with my luggage. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. Was met over the other side uh, w by my uncle, mm -hmm. um, who was actually my cousin, but because he was a lot older than me, you know, in our culture, someone's older than you, you refer to him as uncle. Okay. Um, and yeah, and he picked me up and I was just in awe. I'm, I'm, I remember I wore a suit, wore a silver suit, silver suit, suit uh, with a red, no, with a red hanky okay. in the top left pocket. Yeah. But you didn't have any grass in it? Mm. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Nah. I you couldn't I dare. Went, I, when I got over to Ghana, there wasn't a lot of grass, it was sand, so yeah. I couldn't really put sand inside an A4 paper and start smoking that. So, no. you stayed in Ghana for how long? At that time, it was eight months. It was about eight months, yeah. Okay. And would you say you were sent there mainly because you were deemed to be naughty? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what made, up, you know, what made them decide to bring you back? <laughs> I suppose how I was being treated over there. Um, and it just wasn't working. Okay. You know, there was a lot of abuse, physical abuse. Um, you know, it, 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 it just didn't work. Just you know what? Work. Let me say something quickly. So, I think mainly um, as a professional and equally, um, you know, having two opportunities from both countries. So yes, I was born myself and bred in Ghana, but I think sometimes what some parents may choose to do is, you know what, I'm struggling to look after my son or my daughter, and for that reason, let me send them somewhere for somebody else to look after them. The reality is, if you, the parent, are struggling to look after them, why do you think another person would do a better job mm -hmm. than you? You know, I, I will come back to you. I will definitely come back to you. Leon, you know, you tell us a little bit. I believe you weren't sent to Ghana. No, 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 no. So <laughs> I'm, I'm born and bred in northwest London. Okay. Um, I grew up, uh, well, born in Kilburn, a bit of estates, well, high rises actually, house mm. house. Um, but quickly moved to Wembley, which is north northwest, which is, um, we had, we were covered by Stonebridge. St. Raffles, Harlesden, so basically the worst places mm. in, um, in London at the time. Um, great upbringing though, had two stable parents. My brother did really well from a young age. He went to a, like a performing arts school and started off in a group, so he was doing quite well for himself. But because I was surrounded by those influences at mm. school and so on, um, I didn't do the best at school. Um, that wasn't working for me, so obviously in my spare time I was obviously out with my friends, out and about doing not too great things, mm. to be totally honest. Um, 
I can't say I was the worst of my group. Mm -hmm. I always had that stable base. Um, and the stable base being the parents yeah, that you're coming back parent, to. Two parent household. Mm -hmm. uh, my brother was obviously, as I said, he wasn't well to do financially, but it was well to do when he had a job that was respectable in all walks of life, being in a, a music group and stuff like that. Mm. That kind of carried it. Obviously, I tell people, and then, ooh, ooh, I okay. got that. Oh, you're okay. from the one of those. You're <laughs> different okay. to everybody else. Okay. It's not that. Okay. Um, but yeah, I did that um, at a young age. I, I, I can't lie, I did do my bit in trying to sell it and trying to, but that's obviously playing up to the stereotype of what we as young people thought was cool. And, okay. Yeah, it was in and mm. the right thing to do and mm. how you get up in life from a low income surroundings. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's basically my, my junior years. So the, one of the things that I would definitely want to be doing in this interview, because apart from the fact that we are talking about Akwesi and Leon's junior years, I think what I would definitely want to do is look at what they are doing now, okay? Because we will definitely come back to maybe the teenage years where yeah. the troubles were, yeah. yeah? And I think that is mainly the reason why I want to talk about what you guys are doing now because it might relate to your teenage years as well. Yeah. 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 So Act to Improve is a company that works with vulnerable young people and families. I could see Leon, who wants to go first? Talk to me. What do you guys do? Well, we work for um, the local authority, work in schools, work in AP. Is there a particular local authority? Yeah, well, no, not a particular one. Um, Milton Keynes, they work for Milton Keynes Local Authority. Uh, Oxford, uh, Ellsbury, Slough, um, Wickham. Oh, is there anyone else? And I think those are all the local authorities that I can think of. So can I say if anybody or any local authority is looking for that mentoring role, they are able to contact yeah. you guys? Yeah, they are. Okay, so one of the things that I will be doing is at the end of this interview, I will be putting down your contact details in terms of telephone number and email as well oh, sure. so that in case of anything they can make their referrals to you Brilliant. yeah i could see he's not going to be paying me anything so is you are not <laughs> going to be paying me anything i am doing this just out of respect because i think the most important thing is for us to be able to get such people who are able to help our young people to make the turn around you know to have their listening ears yeah. that sometimes they think parents may be nagging yeah. but equally can have people that they can relate to. So in regards to maybe your work that you do with young people, when the referral comes to you, what do you guys do next? Right, so the referral comes through. So it's not just the local authority that we work for as well. It's for schools. Um, schools? Schools, yeah. Okay. Schools, so high schools, um, primary schools. Um, when I say high schools, secondary schools. That's just showing you my age. Mm. Um, secondary schools, um, AP schools, APs is, is alternative provision, so mm -hmm. an alternative provision would be something like a PRU, like a pupil referral unit. Let me clarify, the main reason being we've got people in other parts of the world yeah. who watches Black Next Gen, okay, so right. if we just assume that, you know, with all the terms that we are using, everybody's going to understand it, we may be selling, you know, some of our viewers a bit short. Okay. So when we're talking about alternative provisions, it's mainly to do with young people who are not able to get the educational needs met in the main school. Yeah, correct. Equally with proof that we may call, it's more or less what people refer our units, yeah. Yeah? yeah? And these information may be available on the internet, so I wouldn't try to claim it as if I know it all, but it's more or less young people who are not able to get the educational needs yeah. met within the mainstream school. Correct. Yeah? So you guys come in yep. with a view to be able to help them Go back into the main school? It, it depends on what setting that, they're, 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 that we're going into. So some of the settings, for example, uh, a PRU or Pupil Referral Unit, um, it depends on the reasons for why they've been sent to that place, that okay. placement in the first place. Some of them have um, the opportunity to go back, okay. whereas some of them, the majority of them, that is their place of learning and education. That is it now for them. Okay. They've been permanently excluded from that particular school. And unfortunately for them, none of the schools within that area or within that county, within that borough, are able to meet their needs. And so they have to be taught by a specialised 
uh, provision mm. who can meet that person's needs. Can I share something as well? So there is evidence to suggest that young black, maybe on most occasions young black males or young black boys tend to find themselves among the highest numbers of people referral units mm -hmm. who are making the highest numbers. So I believe you guys don't just wait to go into the people referral units, you work with the high schools to possibly prevent that exclusion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Talk to me. How do you guys do it? Do you want Leon to go yeah, on sure, that? Go. Yeah. Okay. So um, obviously we come in um, to schools. Uh, we work specifically with um, schools that we obviously have relationships with. Um, they obviously give us referrals for the young people that may be struggling for whatever reason. Um, when we obviously get those referrals, they obviously list the kind of things that they are struggling with and what they do need support with within the schools. And sometimes with, it's outside of school as well, mm -hmm. can relate to their home life as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we obviously get those refer referrals, we obviously look through it, we obviously assess what they kind of need and how we're going to support them. Mm -hmm. We obviously then meet up with a young person and kind of build some rapport with them. Um, to get them feeling comfortable with them. And then we do workshops. Okay. Um, we do games. We ent we're, we're entertaining and we're animated and we're giving them a lot of energy and the kind of energy that they don't normally get in schools. And mm. it kind of gives them a more relaxed environment to learn and take on information. Okay. Basically. Okay. And in terms of maybe your approach being available to the young people, would you say young people who have come through your doors are able to possibly settle? and more or less re-engage back in their education? Some. Okay. Some do. Okay. Some don't, unfortunately, because there's a lot of factors that you've got to consider. You've got the home life, you've got the social life, you've got the community. There's all these different, you've got social medias, social mediums, there's all these different factors that play a part in that young person's growth mm. or development. So, you know, we might, if it's a school, we're in there for six hours. Mm. Um, sometimes possibly one hour per period mm. uh, with that young person. So that's just one hour okay. with an individual, a young person, for the whole week, mm. for the whole seven days. So, you know, the impact, sorry, the, yeah, the, the impact, it, it depends on what feeding into that person's um, uh, behaviour and feeding into that person's lifestyle outside of school. But we have a short time to build up a relationship and a, a rapport with that young person. So we've got to go in mm. and pretty much within the first session, <laughs> within the first five or ten minutes, if not sooner than that, that rapport and that relationship is developed. has to be. Okay. It, you know, and so, like Leon said, the energy. We've got to go in there with the energy. We, we have to understand and know that individual Otherwise, it's not going to work. How far do you have to travel to see these young people? Um, I would say the furthest I'm actually travelling to now would be, um, I think it's a two-hour drive. Okay. Two-hour drive from London, which is, I think it's 100 miles, just short from Birmingham. Wow. Yeah. Just to be able to spend that one hour with a young person? Well, with that particular young person, that's with the local authority. So that's a two hour uh, slot that I was spend with that young person. However, you know, when you're working with young people, it's, it's hard just to put a time limit on it. Mm. I, I, I cannot put a time limit on that. Young. So you've got the minimal slot of two hours. However, I've spent five hours, six hours with a young person before. And what are the kind of behaviours that these young people are more or less presenting in class or maybe in school that warrant you guys to come in? Are they not doing their homeworks? You <laughs> I, know. I wish it was just that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish it was something as simple as okay. doing your homework. Okay, okay. Spill it. You know, well, what kind of behaviours are they into? It's how long is a piece of string? It's any behaviour that a deem, I mean, a school can deem disruptive or mm. not needed or not wanted. Mm. So obviously you get to the variant of school, so some are a little bit more relaxed, some are a little bit more stricter, but you're looking at anything from just being overactive or overly loud or not attentive down to full out having tantrums and rages and flipping tables and wanting to fight and punch and kick. Really? So yeah, of course. There are loads and loads of young people that have that reaction. 
Mm. And it's obviously, as Aquesti was saying, it's down to their, their home lives, their social lives, the, the music they're listening to, obviously all the media that's coming in. So mm. because it obviously it's target, I mean, it comes to them through so many different medias, mm. it's hard to explain or hard to pinpoint and say yeah. kids specifically will do this. Some mm. are just very um, sheltered and quiet and mm. just keep mm. themselves to themselves. But through that, they're not engaging to the level that a school would want them to. Okay. And that could be through negative or adverse um, reasons. But yeah, as I said, it's, it's just a variant. It's, it's impossible to say which ones. I, I, and I would say, just to um, echo what Leon, Leon's saying, the young people, we will work with young people that are either self-harming. So it's not just work with young people that are just naughty. Mm -hmm. So either that, that self-harming from being victims of bullying, self-harming to suicidal thoughts, uh, to grievance issues, um, down the spectrum to antisocial behaviour out in the community, in school, bringing knives in, selling drugs, um, you know, it, like the list goes on. But okay. It, it's, it's in wide. school, selling in, drugs and yeah. all those oh, things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come oh. on. This, 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 is, this is the time we're living in now. Okay. You know, it's, I'm 21, man. Yeah, and, it's not, <laughs> and, it's, and, and to tell you, I, I'll give you a, a little bit of an experience where I was in a pro, this one kid was taking an exam and he was, he was walking funny, you know, like, like a limp. And so some of his peers just thought, yeah, that's how he walks. But no, what he actually had down his pants was a gun. Okay. Yes, you! <laughs> you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of his peers came up to him and said, oh, yeah, this person... He showed me this weapon. Like, oh, okay, cool. So, you know, we're going from the days of catapults, mm -hmm. you know, to yeah. now. Yeah. They got they, yeah, yeah. guns and, and, and knives. You know, it's, that's unfortunately becoming the norm. Just now, I was just having a chat with uh, a young per a, a family worker from from a particular area who um, told me that he's working with a young person, he's supporting a young person who I was working with, he just wants some, some information, and this person's carrying a Rambo knife. Okay. You know, okay. and so, and he's carrying it in an area where he's not expected, it's an affluent area. Okay. You okay. know, so this type of behavior, where it was common in areas where myself and Leon grew up in, mm. is now filtering into affluent areas okay you know so it's a huge problem let me share something quickly as well so also in my line of practice i think sometimes what some parents do believe is going on is if i am from an affluent background some of these behaviors are never going to come through my door but i think what we are hearing from both leon and aquisi is there is so much pressure you know, in terms of social media, yeah. you know, in terms of what young people wanting to belong. And for that reason, in as much as, you know, you may be out there looking after your family, some of these things, our young people need that particular kind of base. They need, kind of, they need that kind of space where they can actually develop the kind of, you know, values that you bring to them when they are within the family home. So this is a situation where it is more or less nationwide, yeah. and I believe it's not just going to be in England. Yeah. I believe in other parts of the world as well. Yeah. We are having young people exhibit different kind of behaviors, yeah. but possibly what we are asking is in those parts of the world as well, do we have such mentors who are able to go into schools, who are able to go into local authorities or even churches, mm -hmm. you know, to help young people to be able to find somebody to relate to and talk to, yeah? And I think that's something that could be looked into just to make sure that young people who do not see mom or dad to be the coolest people yeah. can find people yeah. that they can equally talk to, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. yeah? So just like we were talking on initially, I could see, you yeah. know, you are supporting young people who are going through, let me use the word trauma. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And through right. the trauma, they do exhibit a whole lot of different behaviors. Yeah. So young people being gangs, young people being excluded from school. Yeah. Um, you know, young people being in fights, you know, and all that. And this is both genders. It's not about a boy, you know, a male thing or a female thing. Yeah. You got it, you know, cut across. And I believe equally, it's not just about a black thing, it's a black and white thing because 
the disruption are equally represented. Mm -hmm. Akwesi, talk to us about your, you know, your formative years. When you were growing up as a young lad, yeah. did you exhibit any of these behaviours? Yes, I did. Um, before I get on to the later years, I was excluded from one, one, one of my secondary schools and I went back over to Ghana for the second time. And then when I came back, no school in the London borough would take me on. Um, and so I had to go to what was called <laughs> the reject school. Okay. Um, and during that time, I just never went. I just, I just couldn't bother. My, my education was messed up. Mm. You know, Africa, back again. Africa, back again. It was just messed up. It was, you know, it was a terrible experience. So would you say that's a bit of advice to some parents? Who may think, yeah. yeah, maybe sending you away yeah. will be a solution to some of the challenges that it, they may have to do. Let's not, let, I mean, for me, culturally, it was brilliant because I embraced my culture. I got to see my motherland. I got to see where I, where I come from. And, you know, it, I cannot take that away because... We'll see you, Ghana. Go for it. Yeah, <laughs> happy days. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was an absolute, for me, I mean, I'm one of four siblings and... It was just, it was beautiful. That's in my teens, in my late years, early 20s, I started um, dabbling in seven class A's. Okay. Class A's and class B's. Can I possibly help, just like I keep on saying, for the viewers who are not just maybe UK based, yeah. people in other countries may not understand what you mean by class A's and okay. class B's. What exactly do you mean by selling class A's and B's? Okay, so class B's was cannabis, mm -hmm. um, and class A's was uh, ecstasy and cocaine. Okay, so that was what you were selling. Yeah. Okay. And it was, and it was on a, it was on a pretty, it was on a big scale. Okay. Yeah. So we're probably doing like an ounce a week. Okay. Maybe that's a big scale to some, or small scale to others, but you know, mm -hmm. for us. For me, it was a it was a big scale, okay. um, you know, and it, but then it led down, <laughs> it led down different avenues, um, and I think for me, my U turn was uh, not only for before that, we go to the U turn, were you just selling? No, and that's the thing. And for anyone who thinks that they won't become addicted to what they're selling, it's an absolute lie. Okay. you know, you will you will start dabbling in you know the product that you're selling. Mm. Um, and that is you using the class That's age. you using it. So, okay. uh, you know, I used cocaine and it was a lifestyle, um, you know, and, and the money comes in and the money goes out. As fast as it comes in, it goes out. Okay. Um, and so, and ecstasy as well. Um, and then it opens up your mind and your world to different avenues and walks of life. And for me, my new term was, um, I, yeah, I became addicted to it, which was a problem. Um, which I needed and I seek support for that uh, but the U-turn for me was when I hit rock bottom my rock bottom was the suicidal tendencies um, and when I got offered to start selling firearms okay. so when I got offered to start selling firearms that's when I knew whoa, I'm in a world now that if I go beyond this there's no coming back, coming back okay. and so it was like it was it was the wake up call for me, along with, you know, the other things that was, you know, going on in my life as well. Okay, see, let me interrupt you. So usually there is that perception that with maybe African parents or maybe Caribbean parents, they are usually strict. So how come you decide, you know, you were able to, you know, do all these things, although it is believed or there is that perception out there that, you know what, you may be coming from a very strict background mm. and those things may not happen within your home. Well, okay, with that there, um, sometimes that can be a problem mm -hmm. because when the strictness came with the, the, the discipline that came with my behaviour was um, it was a snap. The, the, there was no dialogue, okay. and that was the issue. When there's no dialogue, and that's something that I've learned and developed in my life with my kids to have the dialogue. So, I could see at the moment you're working as a behavior expert. Yeah. What you are saying to us is, in as much as maybe parents may mean well for their children, yeah. when the dialogue is not there, that is when children may find, or young people yeah. may find their own escape routes. Yeah, because they're going to find, they're going to find an alternative. If they're not getting, if they're not getting that feedback from you, they're going to go somewhere else. Okay. They will go somewhere else and 
generally, usually, it is their friends. Okay. And even the young person that we were speaking to today in school, his 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 um, but he, his place to to glean or to to get knowledge is from YouTube. Okay. And it was like, yo, listen, not everything you see and read on the internet is true. You know what, if this young person is equally looking for information, I would definitely encourage him, come on to Black Next Gen, yeah? <laughs> You'll see positive people, you see positive males who have possibly gone through the lines and decided that some of these things really doesn't help. So if you want that kind of positive information to hear, then definitely they can come on the channel. Let's do a little bit, Leon. So in terms of maybe upbringing, parenting-wise, yeah. how was your one for you? Um, period wise, my upbringing was, it was good. I, I can't, I mean, I had, you know, typical Caribbean parents. Um, it, at the time, yeah, hitting was definitely, I got, I got licks. I yeah, got, boy. I, oh man, you I got, got licks. Lick. All right, all right. <laughs> licks. Um, mm. but yeah, um, really they were always supportive, always quite, you know, nice. I mean, it was a bit of a different because it, the only thing that I found now being older, having grown up in the system, was a, was a problem was their understanding of the system okay because obviously they were they grew up in Jamaica and they came over um, mm. without well, with the Jamaican education but without knowing about the English system okay so they did the best they could to raise um, a son or two sons in it but yeah when you don't really understand the system obviously now I work in schools and stuff like that I actually understand there's a different side of the system there's a whole other language that schools will use to mm obviously disinform or misinform, let's say, um, teach or parents and so yeah, so that side of it for me was a problem. The actual idea that they didn't understand the system that they were trying to raise me in and they had their strict Jamaican backgrounds, but I was obviously a young boy growing up in London, so when I'm at school, it was totally different for okay. me. I was, I was seeing things that wasn't happening at home which allowed me to try and think I could bring it back home. But okay. <laughs> that got taken out. This does not mean, you know, <laughs> we are condoning to any sad behaviours. We need to make sure we set it very straight oh, on yeah, camera. Yeah. No one's condoning to but it. I'm just being it, honest yeah, with what yeah. happened to me at the time. And, and that's really, we are not talking about, you know, these recent times, but I think the most important thing is people are sharing their past experiences, yeah. which possibly inform them in a different way and for that reason the only affiliation they could think of was not their home but possibly people outside their home yeah leon you've said to me that you are a qualified teacher but you rather prefer not to be in the classroom yeah well that, that comes with it as well it was, it was the actual way to get into teaching obviously um as i first first was qualified i um couldn't find anything that actually suited me in the areas that i was looking and i um my brother was working in an industry um, in a youth centre in Windsor and he knew someone that worked in another centre with one of the places that I used to work in Slough and it just kind of linked through that mm. but then actually being there and working with vulnerable, this is a prune style, sorry, mm. um, yeah, but being there and working with vulnerable people um, allowed me to realise that this is where I wanted to, to no. be. I mean, I know, teaching's great and they think bad about teaching but yeah that's where i felt that we're in the school right yeah that's what I'm saying. sorry i'm sorry i apologize but yeah that's what i felt my niche was and what i actually wanted to give mm. to young people that were misunderstood i mean my school was terrible my school was terrible mostly because i was i am dyslexic sorry and as a young black male in the area that i grew up with it was like yeah he's just not trying hard Okay. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there wasn't nowadays where you say dyslexic and everyone understands it. it was like, nah, man, he's just not trying. They didn't yeah. even know I was dyslexic. I didn't know I was dyslexic until I was yeah. in college and then a teacher just suggested it to me. It was only when I was in university that actually it was like, okay, let's actually test and see if this, this yeah. young person is dyslexic. So mm -hmm. at the time, my schooling was horrible, so I just gave up on school because they mm -hmm. didn't, they gave up on me before mm -hmm. I even started so for me schooling was terrible and obviously going through the system and now getting to the place that i am i realized that that is actually what i want to do rather than teach all of the kids i actually want to work with the ones that needed it the most the that's most great. vulnerable ones and there we are that's great and i think i could see you did say to me there was a point in time where you felt 
schooling became a chore? Yeah, it did. Okay, why um, that? Before we do get on to that, I just wanted to add as well, yeah, in regards to my, my parents, they were great, loving parents. That's it good. wasn't just... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, that like butter <laughs> on my face. You know, great loving parents to the yeah. point where, you know, four of their kids all now own successful businesses. Okay. So, you know, they did. <laughs> and in regards to my schooling, it was, it was, it was challenging. Um, being the, being, there was two, two black kids in primary, primary middle school. Um, which was just, oh, it was the understanding, mm. you know, the teachers just didn't understand culturally where I and that girl was coming from, more so myself, because they just didn't understand, and I remember this one teacher, um, this is how bad, this is how, this is, this is the system, but this is, this, I say back then, but it, it's still present in this day and age as well, mm. in certain areas. Uh, where my my name my name is Aquesi, mm -hmm. spell A K W E S I or A K W A S I. Mm -hmm. However, that teacher decided to take it upon herself to say, "Well, no, your name is spelled A Q U E S I." Okay. So a textbook to say, "You can't tell me that's how I pronounce my name." Get out of here. Like how it's how you see it. Wow. And so, and that's at, that was at an age of like oh, five. Okay. Five, six. Mm. Five or six. I can't remember. Mm. Um, so when you go through that experience, and then you're 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 seen, and they make you feel as if you're stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, because of what my condition. I was that kid that just had loads of energy. Okay. Being tested for ADHD, haven't been diagnosed, but being tested for ADHD, I can go through that. That's you know, for that, that, that channel to get tested, but what's, what's the point? Well, sorry, to get diagnosed, but you know, there's, there's no point. I know, I know who I am, I know, you know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. Mm. Um, but one thing that I learned about myself at such a young age, and this is when I was in Ghana the second time, when I had to study and learn the native language, which was Chi, mm -hmm. spelled T-W-I, not T. R E E mm. T, um, and I had to learn the language, but I had to learn how to write it. Okay. Now, for someone who is stupid, stupid okay, yeah, mm. or not intelligent, not smart, to go over to another country and learn that language, and then start getting nine out of ten and ten out of ten. Mm. Come on now. Mm. So that taught me and showed me, well, you actually a smart, intelligent kid. That's great. You know, but when you've got that pushed on you and. You know, no, you're, the, you're, you're this, you're that, you're that, you're this, you're that, you're that, you're that. Just negativity, yeah. it becomes an issue. And a lot of black kids at the moment are going through that. A lot of kids are going through that where you are seen to be, no, you're not clever, you're this. Why don't you try doing something like that? Why don't you try doing something like this? No. Work on the person's strengths. Get to know the person. What were your strengths, Akwizi? My strengths? What, when I was a kid? Yep. Oh, my strengths. I was an active, I had a lot of energy. Mm. Um, and from... Uh, Knowing myself, and that my, I was languages. Football. Football. Yeah, football was one of my strengths. Okay. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I loved football. Were uh, your parents accepting football? See, this is the thing. My dad didn't accept football, but he played a lot of football. Okay. He played, and it's. I don't know if any of you lot have seen a film called Pele, but when I look at that film, there, I can relate and connect to that film well because Pele's dad. Mm was also a great football player. However, he didn't encourage his son to play football, you know? And okay. so that was my dad, that was my father. There's two of us, me and my brother. So he didn't encourage us to play football. It was more of a discouragement. Mm. And my mum used to go and watch him play football. You know, he used to, he was really, really good. Was it because they were expecting you to be the doctor, the yeah. lawyer? Yeah, okay. and that was pretty much what Leon was saying, the culture, from coming over from Ghana to the UK, it was a culture imbalance in understanding what the need is for your son or your daughter. It was... So let me say something quickly to wrap up. So I think basically what we are hearing is, in as much as parents may want their children, you know, their young people to aspire to do 
whatever they want to do in education. What it actually means is sometimes young people tend to struggle when the pressure is a bit too much. Mm. And for that reason, if the pressure tends to be too much, that is when we end up having some of these behaviors in school because young people start not to believe in themselves or to start to feel like, you know what, they've not been able to live to mom and dad's dreams, okay? And for that reason, that is when Akwesi and Leon comes in to be able to come into the schools to prevent, maybe to manage some of these behaviors. And if these behaviors cannot be managed within the school, unfortunately, young people tend to be excluded and you still end up going into the proofs or you know, people refer our unit to help them maintain, to get some decent qualifications, yeah? I'm sure no parent will be doing this intentionally, but sometimes through this education or this kind of information, parents become very much aware so that they don't end up, you know, putting their children in very, you know, holes, very difficult holes where their children are not able to survive. Um, to sum it all, Leon, if we are saying, you know, if you need to share anything with parents out there, or young people out there, what would be your final words to them? Mine would be, um, well, parents definitely, um, and it might sound trivial, but get to know your child. Mm. Like a lot of parents don't get, actually take the time to get to know their young person. And for me, ultimately support them in what they want to do, because when you're young, the world is your oyster. Mm. The, and especially at this time in, to 2021, a child can near enough do anything. That's great. Mm. So if you support your child and you teach them that, as long as they're willing to put the work in mm. and to obviously experiment, try and fail, mm. to get it wrong, mm. to be able to pick themselves up and go on again, then they can do anything. So if you support them in that, they'll grow up believing that and that will then stop them from being so, what is it, sucked into the media frenzy that young people are going through at the mm. moment and having them source all of this family orientation from outside sources. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much, Leon. I could say, what will be your final words? You know, you've got parents out there yeah. who tune in to the channel, well, and young people as yeah. well, you know. I know a young person may be saying, oh, I could see I've met him before, you know. He <laughs> came in when I was being kicked out. Yeah, I yeah, understand. But this is him, <laughs> you know. What will be your advice to young people and parents out there? Parents, if you do not spend that time with your child, they will find that time through technology. And I'll just give you a quick... 20, 30 seconds. Over the weekend, I spent quality time with my kids. We had a bake-off, um, put my apron on, done the bake-off, my sisters were the judges. Um, and then after that, we had a pamper session where my daughter was, she got this face mask and she was, it's it just brilliant. And she pampered for me for like an hour. Is spend time, quality time with your kids. You, because if you don't, they'll find that time outside the home environment. Mm. And the other thing about it is, if you have been through negative uh, experiences with your kid, there's always time to replace those memories with new memories. The present now is the time to create new memories. Because in five years from now, you can look back at that present time with the new memories, the new positive memories that you created. Mm. Okay, 10 years ago, five years from before that, there were negative memories. Mm. So start creating positive memories now. You've still got that time. So create your positive memories now. So in the future, you can look back at that this time and say, we had focus on the positive memories that you've created now instead of the negative memories that you created five years from that present. Guys, I think for me, I'm really humbled, you know, being given the opportunity to meet such brilliant you know, men, and I'm really proud of you, you know, um, as fathers, as mentors, you know, um, because of what you're doing for the black minority groups and, as, and equally other young people as well who need your support and you've definitely been able to come in to support them at that very difficult time. I am really proud of you, and I think what I continue to say is, um, Young people may not need their parents to be the individuals that they speak to. They just need a trusted person that they can go to when things are difficult. 
So amongst ourselves, you know, amongst families, we need to be able to create that safe space, yeah. that safe auntie, that safe uncle, you know, that safe person in the church, in the community, where our young people can go in there and confide in them, and actually these safe people can actually help them bring them up. I will definitely share one thing. I am waiting to have an interview with this young guy who is called Denzel. Denzel was bullied in school, okay? So just watch out for this very particular person because although he was bullied in school, Denzel has actually written a book and I hear he's been signed by Stormzy as well. Wow. Okay? Yeah. So these are the narratives yeah. that we want to be able to put out there. The people who actually has a story where, you know, in actual fact, people never believed in them, they have been able to break through. So if I brought you these two guys, I am really humbled, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll say to everybody out there, if you haven't signed on to Black Next Gen, we will be bringing you lots of amazing people. These are my special people for the week. And I say thank you very much, you know, for your support. If you are watching us for the very first time, just like I said, my name is Nana S.A. Um, yeah, we have this project called Black Next Gen. What we intend to do is to bring people like this on your screens who can tell you their stories, motivate you, for you to take the next step. You can definitely follow us on social medias. You've got the Instagram, Facebook. To, you know, I'm catching up. I'm also learning as well, you know. But the bottom line is thank you very much for sticking tuned and uh, yeah, actually enjoying this conversation. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you, man. And thanks very much for coming on. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Man.